Hello again, video lecture number two of this week. Uh, this one's going to focus on colonial society, thinking about the Puritan and what it was like to live in colonies that are not Virginia or the Carolinas. Let's start with Plymouth Colony. Uh, November 1620, uh, the Puritans are going to land in New England in what is today the Cape Cod area. Uh, then they move to Plymouth and they name their new settlement Plymouth, based after the city that they sailed from in England. Now these Puritans are better known as Pilgrims. Um, they are followers of John Calvin, meaning that they are related to Presbyterians. Uh, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Puritans are all the same thing. Um, this is a very radical group of Calvinists, or a very radical group of Puritans. And they believed that they had to separate from the Church of England to purify Christianity. Now, many of these pilgrims had lived in Holland or the Netherlands before they came to America, but they left Holland because they were afraid that Catholic Spain was going to take over Holland again. They also didn't want their children to grow up Dutch. They wanted their children to grow up in a, an English Settlement. So there are 100 people on the main flag, but only 30 of them are pilgrim separatists. That meant 70 of them were not pilgrims. Now I know that's just simple math, 100 minus 30 is 70, but I wanted to highlight it because most people think the main flower is full of pilgrims, but in reality it's only 30 of them. What's really important about this, um, the non separate the non-pilgrims were really worried because they thought they would be forced to live as a pilgrim. So even before they get to New England, the document called the Mayflower Compact is signed. And it's it created a simple system of legal authority and it promised religious freedom. Now, once the settlers land, they realize how harsh the conditions are, and they immediately start building shelters, and they immediately start the, um, the forage or provisions, and they immediately try to, you know, batten down the hatches, if you will, for winter. Uh, no matter what, though, only about half of the settlers are going to survive that first winter. And it's not until they get help from a local native group called the Poconoke that they're able to really establish themselves. Now, the Poconoke group, they already suffered an, an epidemic from contact with Europeans. And they had an enemy called the Narragansett Indians that they were trying to protect themselves from. So the Poconoke thought if we ally ourselves with these settlers, then we can receive protection from the Narragansett. So they gave the settlers food and they, they taught them how to plant and what to plant that would grow well in the area. And they're able to survive. One of the natives named Squanto, it's a little different than the story you've probably been told, He's actually captured and taken to England as a prisoner, and he's taught English, and he becomes known as a, quote, good Indian, because he's able to translate English and help communicate between the Poconokets and the Pilgrims. There's a guy named William Bradford. Um, he's really interesting because he wrote a book called Of Plymouth Plantation. And William Bradford was the governor of the Plymouth Colony five times. And he lives from 1590 all the way to 1657. And he tells the story of the Pilgrims. Uh, he starts with 1608 settling in the Dutch Republic. He talks about the 1620 Mayflower trip. And it ends, he ends his story in 1647 where he provides a list of all 100 passengers and what happened to them. 
that means that he documented everything and we know without a doubt who those 100 people were and we can trace their lineage so if anybody ever tells you that their their people came over on the mayflower you can research it and you can find out if they're telling the truth or not. another colony that settled nearby is called the massachusetts bay colony these were also puritans but they were not pilgrims and they still want to purify the church, but they don't quite go to the same lengths as pilgrims do. Um, and the Puritans, King James I doesn't really like them very much, so he, he wants to get rid of them. So these Puritans, they gather together some money and they buy part of the Virginia Company's claim to the New World. And the Massachusetts Bay Colony is going to settle in what is today Boston area. The leader of this colony is going to be John Winthrop, who you read about last week. He wants to make the Massachusetts colony a city on a hill. In other words, he wants this to be the example for future settlements to look like. He wanted to build a godly community. Uh, he wanted to show that his version of Christian of Christianity was better than what the Church of England was doing. Uh, he wanted to end destructive economic competition. He was he basically said everybody has an obligation to help others out. Now, he doesn't mean charity as in giving stuff away. Uh, he basically just means to work together to temper or tame the drive for profit. Basically, we, we all work together and we all succeed together. So that's what he means by a model of Christian charity. What were these New England communities like? Well, the church, the Puritan church, or as I'm going to call it here, the Congregationalist church, was really the center of town, both physically and spiritually. I mean, the church was literally in the center of town. Membership in the church was required. Everyone was required to attend church services, and they had to pay tithes, even if they're not a member. But you have to accept the church as your controller to be accepted into that society. And if you were banished from church services, you were basically put outside of society. Control of the church was in the hands of these all-male saints. Uh, but periods of churches were democratic. All the saints were allowed to participate in control. Now, Puritan control is going to extend beyond the church. Uh, public meetings, including the county court, are going to be held at the church. Uh, public officials are going to be members of the church. There's very little separation between civil law and church law. But technically, on paper, church and state were separate. But in reality, the cooperation between church and state was very, very close. Now, as far as the actual layout of the church goes, uh, the church was in the center of town, as I said earlier. Most dwellings are within one mile of the church, and that's because you had to be able to hear the church bell or the church bell ring so you can come to church. Uh, residents of the town, they're given certain plots of land further out for farming, and each family is given enough land to provide for their needs. And very often, your farm plot was on the opposite side of town from where your home was. The point of that was so that you would have to walk through town, mingle, talk to people, and everybody knew your business. That was basically a forced sense of community, a forced sense of dependence. Now the Puritan family, the husband is the head, it's a nuclear family, the mom, dad, Kids, a couple servants, maybe. Marriage 
not a private affair. Um, it was basically a contract governed by the state, and it could be regulated by both the church and the state. Uh, both the church and the state could interfere in your family if they thought it was necessary. Women have no property rights in New England unless a husband specifically grants them in writing. And children are going to be educated in the church to encourage them to follow the church beliefs. Now, as far as population growth goes, the settlers who came to New England, they usually did that as part of a family if they were there to stay long term. So you have a fairly relative even number of males and females, and that leads to a more natural and quicker population growth. Um, you only get about 20,000 Puritans or so that come over, but natural population growth is going to expand this number radically. Now, not everybody's happy. There are a couple of religious dissenters who disagree with the Puritans and with the uh, Congregational Church. Um, probably the most famous of them is Roger Williams. Uh, Roger Williams, he's going to dissent because he's going to say that the civil government and the church should be absolutely separate. He's one of the big proponents of separating church and state, making church and state. Uh, he did not appreciate the mandatory church attendance. He definitely didn't like the mandatory church offerings, especially when it interfered with a person's individual rights and beliefs. So the Puritan authorities, they're going to see Williams as subversive, as a troublemaker. They're going to banish him from the colony. And when Williams leaves the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a number of followers are going to go with him. And he's going to purchase land from the Narragansett Indians, and he's going to create a new settlement south of Boston known as Providence Colony. You know Providence Colony today better as the capital city of Rhode Island. Another religious dissenter is Anne Hutchinson. Um, Anne Hutchinson, she believed in salvation of grace. Uh, she was uh, very big on the Martin Luther point of view that um, salvation can be achieved just through belief. And she, being a woman, strongly felt and argued that women should play a major role in public affairs. Just like Roger Williams, Anne Hutchinson is going to be banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, she ends up dying, and after she's dead, the Puritan authorities, they claim she was impregnated by the devil. They just throw her name through the mud any way they can. There are other groups that are banished as well. Uh, Quakers, who I'll talk about in a moment. Baptists are, are banished. And um, if they're not banished, they're executed. They're not following the ways of the congregational church. Now, the Salem Witch Trial. Pretty famous, you've probably heard of them. Uh, they're gonna happen in 1691 and 1692. And it really plays into this whole following the Congregationalist Church, um, people up and coming versus old established people. And pretty much what happens is in December of 1691, there's a girl named Betty Paris. And her cousin named Abby Williams. The Paris household has a slave named Tituba, and Tituba tells Betty's fortune and Abby's fortune. And soon after doing this, the two girls begin to behave strangely. Now, the stories that Tituba would tell the two girls were based on the voodoo religion. And before you know it, these two girls 
begin claiming that they have been turned into witches. They, Betty Paris is nine years old, Abby Williams is 11 years old. They start to bark, they go into fits, contortions, outbursts. A doctor named Dr. William Riggs sees them and he diagnoses them with bewitchment. Three people are arrested and three people are initially blamed for turning Betty and Abby into witches. First one is Sarah Good. Sarah Good was a homeless woman. Then there's Sarah Osborne, who was a poor woman. Then finally, there was Tituba, who was the slave of the Paris family. By the way, the Paris family was fairly well off. I think, if I remember right, Mr. Paris was the colony governor. Now all three, Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tituba, trying to save themselves, say they are Satan's servants. They try to tell the Inquisitors what they want. And before you know it, this blows up completely. More than 300 people are going to be accused of being a witch in the little village of Salem. By the time it's all done, more than 30 of these 300 are hanged. Now, there's no burning at the stake. It's not Europe. Uh, if this had been Europe, sure, there probably would have been stake burning. But in Salem, the wood was too valuable. So the, the condemned witches were just hanged from a tree. Basic mob mentality is going to break out. Names are thrown out left and right. A bunch of residents go to jail. Uh, eventually, the girls are going to confess. And they're going to say, we made it up. And the two girls are going to be banished from the colony. When we get to October of 1692, the governor, William Phipps, he's going to have just gotten to the colony from Britain. He puts an end to the trials. He pardons 100 people who are sitting in jail. And he pardons the 200 who are accused waiting for trial. Now, it has then discussed at length why these girls did it. And historians think it's probably a couple of different things. Number one, these two girls wanted attention. So they made up stories so people would pay attention to them. Then there's this feud over land and property. You notice the three people who were accused initially were lower class people while the Paris family and the Williams were upper class. There's also religion involved. Because if you didn't meet the, a particular Puritan standard, then there were questions to be asked. Now what really did happen? It's, once again, it's been looked at and discussed and researched. And the bread that was used in Salem was rye, rye bread. And there's a fungus called ergot that can get into the rye bread and it causes all of the symptoms that Betty and Abby had. In other words, their food source was bad and their food source caused them to get sick and the Salem witch trials are the result of that sickness. Now, if we move on from here, uh, there's another group of colonies to talk about real quick called the Utopian Colonies. And the two Utopian colonies are Pennsylvania and Georgia. Now, Pennsylvania is going to be founded by William Penn in 1681. William Penn was a Quaker, better known as the Society of Friends. And this is probably the most influential of the radical groups to come out of the English Civil War. Uh, the Society of Friends, they follow the doctrine of individual spiritual inspiration, individual interpretation of the gospel. They got rid of sacraments. They got rid of ministers. They were all about simple living. They were all about being pacifists and tolerating everybody else. They also believe in equality of the sexes and full participation of women in religious affairs. So 
but it was very forward thinking for the time. Now, William Penn, he's going to receive a land grant from King Charles II in 1581. And Penn is going to actively recruit other religious dissenters to his colony. So we've got the Society of Friends or the Quakers. Uh, they have no sacraments, no offices, no ministers, no baptism, no Lord's Supper, no clergy. And they sit in silence. And when they they see this inner light when they have this revelation, they start to quake in their seat. You also have Mennonites who are known as Anabaptists or rebaptizers. Um, they were based on the mission or the ministry of Jesus. Uh, you have the Amish who are like Mennonites, but they chew or shun technology, I should say. And then there are Baptists. And these Baptists were different because they didn't baptize at birth like a lot of religious sects or denominations did at the time. And because they waited for believers' baptism versus infant baptism, they were kicked out of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and invited into Pennsylvania. So you have William Penn who is treating everybody as an equal. He is on friendly relations with the main population. And all taxpayers and all land owners in Pennsylvania, they had a right to vote in the government. Then you have Georgia. Georgia is founded by James Oglethorpe in 1732. And this was really philanthropy and prison reform. General James Oglethorpe is the governor of Georgia, and he proposes to the king that Georgia should be a debtor's colony. In other words, people who are in prison in England because they owe money should be allowed to come to Georgia, make a living, and then send part of their money back to England to pay off their debts. James Oglethorpe is also going to say, Georgia's far enough south that they can produce olive, they can make silk, they'll grow citrus. And the king is thinking, well, I can put a colony there and I can protect myself from the Spanish and poor. So the colony is going to be developed using these utopian ideals. Uh, for example, Governor Oglethorpe is going to say the land holdings are limited to 500 acres. Uh, there's no rum, no, there's no alcohol, there's absolutely no slaves. Indentured servants can be brought in in limited numbers, but absolutely no slaves. Now, unfortunately for James Oglethorpe, this experiment went to fail. Uh, by 1759, all the restrictions that were lifted on the settlers complained. Or all of the settlers are going to complain about the restrictions, and they're going to be lifted because right across the river from Savannah is South Carolina. And South Carolina was being was very, very well off economically and exceeding where Georgia was failing. Now, population is going to grow dramatically in New England during the 1700s. More than 650,000 immigrants are going to come to the New World to move into the English colonies. Half of them are unwilling because they're slaves, but we still have to count them. There's natural population growth, uh, early marriages, and decrease of births. Uh, if you are white, you're married by the early 20s. If you are black, you're married by the late teens. Women, if you're listening to this, uh, you're, you would give birth on average every two years. Also, there's lower mortality. Uh, the colonies are starting to spread out, so there's less crowding. And with less crowding, it means that there is a, a smaller chance for contagious diseases to become an epidemic. There is a competition between different European groups who are moving into the New World. We have 
a large number of European immigrants that are going to move in. We have the Scots Irish and the Scots in the Northern English. They're going to come to the New World in 1720. They're going to start out in Western Virginia and they're going to move south along the Piedmont of the Carolinas and into the Northeast Georgia. Germans are going to do the same thing. Uh, around 1750, a decent number of Germans are going to move into Virginia and then move from further south into the Carolinas and areas north of Georgia. England, France, and Spain are all competing for control of the North American continent. And all three are going to see the middle of the continent as the, the goal. And Europeans, the English, the French, and the Spanish are all going to be using populations against each other to try and one up their enemies and their competition. Now, as far as African Americans go, 325,000 African Americans, or Africans, I should say, are brought to America where they are brought as slaves. Most of these slaves come to the Chesapeake area, Virginia and Maryland, or they go to South Carolina. Back by 1730, two out of every three people in South Carolina are from Africa. And there are slave rebellions very early. For example, 1712, in New York City, slaves conspired with poor whites to burn down much of the city. The plot was discovered. 31 blacks or whites were charged with conspiracy and then executed. In 1739, there's something called the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina. And ironically, this rebellion is linked back to the Congo in Africa. Um, in the early 1700s, the country of Belgium is in the process of colonizing what well, is today the Congo, a group of Native people from the Congo are going to revolt against the King of Belgium, and they're sent to South Carolina as slaves. And some of these same slaves are going to rebel against their masters in 1739. Twenty slaves are going to raid a store where they find muskets, and they're going to plan and escape to the Spanish Florida. Along the way, these 20 Africans are going to be joined by about 80 more. They're going to burn down seven plantations, kill 20 white plantation people, and they're captured a little more than a day after the rebellion ends. All the people involved in the rebellion are executed, their heads are cut off, and their head is placed on every mile post where they were caught back in Charleston. Now, the way that that rebellion was put down uh, is really going to be a turning point in the way African Americans are treated in this country. Now, daily life in the colonies is very much early colonial period based on the ideals of the Enlightenment, uh, the new ideas of separation of church and state, the inalienable rights of man. Um, A just government has to work for the people. Um, basically, everything that you ever learned in a civics or a, a uh, political science class. Jean Jacques Rousteau, Montesquieu, all of that. This is when those ideas are really taking shape. Uh, there is some education. People are expected to learn the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic, but in reality, it doesn't happen that way. Um, only about half of the people in the English colonies get enough education to master the basics. A majority of the women in the colonies are illiterate, and education becomes a social status because of it. If you are wealthy enough to become educated, then you are upper class. Because of this lack of literacy, there's this really strong oral culture. Uh, information is passed by word of mouth that is frequently shared through both stories and songs. And because of this oral culture, the information is going to move really slow and it doesn't go very far. 
for those who are upper class, the elite culture, um, basically businessmen, planters, and political elite, uh, they send their children to England or New England for education. Uh, they entertain on a large scale. Large buildings, large residences, I should say. Uh, they're the ones wearing the fancy clothes, powdered wigs, drinking tea with their pee up. And they expect everybody else to kind of defer to them. Uh, they expect to be shown extra deference, if you will. What about religion, though? Um, you do have Congregationalists, but there's also the Episcopalians, uh, that's the Church of England in America. And both the Congregationalists and the Episcopalians, they worship in this hierarchical setting. Um, and it's a lot about money. Wealthy families could purchase their own seats. And in some churches, almost all the pews are purchased. So the poorer classes and those who are new to the area are forced out of the church and they have to go from their own. And by separating the people in the church, it kind of reinforced this different social strata. So you've got lower class people in lower churches, you've got higher class people in higher classes. Quakers, though, they're, they're a little more open to everyone. Their meetings are very informal. There are men and women who both participate. And no matter whether you're a Congregationalist, an Episcopalian, or a Quaker, uh, you didn't attend church regularly, mainly because still uh, you're too far from a church where there aren't enough pastors. The Great Awakening, however, is going to be like a like a revival of the church, if you will. Uh, the two big names from the Great Awakening are. Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield. And this is going to be a movement that is against the Enlightenment. They're going to say that Christianity has gotten too thinking based. Also, the wealth of some Puritan and Quaker merchants is going to make people think that Satan is tempting them. Then on top of that, you have the people living in the backwoods. They don't have any ministers to give them official sacraments. So by 1730, it, people in the New World felt like, or I should say in the English colonies, they felt like Christianity was starting to fall apart. So in 1734 and in 1735, Jonathan Edwards is going to come to Massachusetts and he's going to start preaching. Now, uh, Jonathan Edwards, he's convinced that Christians had become too preoccupied with making and spending money, and that religion had become too intellectual, so it had lost its emotional force. And his most famous sermon, and you have to read that this week, is called Sinners in the Hands of an Ancient God. He delivers this sermon July 8, 1741. And he's basically going to describe the Christian God as holding you over a pit of open flame, and only his good grace and only his mercy is what is keeping him from dumping you into the inferno of hell. Um, it says, natural men are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell. They have deserved the fiery pit, and are already sentenced to it. And God is dreadfully provoked. All that preserves them every moment is the unobliged forbearance of an incense or angry God. And he's also going to show the redemption from God's wrath. Uh, he says, you have an extraordinary opportunity, a day where in Christ has thrown the door of mercy wide open and stands in calling and crying with a loud voice of poor sin. Uh, he's going to, this is like the 1730s version of Scared Straight. Jonathan Edwards is saying that the Christian God is saving you simply because he's toying with you. He doesn't want to kill you. And at any moment, you can be cast into the pits of hell. Witnesses wrote about that day, and one witness said, there was such a breathing of distress and weeping 
that Edwards had to ask for silence so that he could be heard. People were scared to death when he was in the cell. George Whitefield, um, he's going to proclaim that congregations are lifeless because dead men preach them. And he's going to draw big crowds when he comes to the New World to preach. When he arrives in Philadelphia, uh, 6,000 people are going to come listen to his sermon, including Ben Franklin, who, by the way, was extremely non-religious. Ben Franklin was impressed enough by what George Whitefield had to say that Ben Franklin donated to Whitefield. As hardcore as Jonathan Edwards was, he went and listened to Whitefield give a sermon, and Jonathan Edwards himself felt that he was spiritually weak and unworthy. And the Screen Awakening is going to spark the vision amongst many churches. Uh, there are some who, you know, think that this is a good idea, that the church needs to be reborn. And then there's also a group who say, uh, this is too much, this is too far, this is going to hurt the church. So, it doesn't have the intended outcome of bringing Christianity back together. Now, politics in the colonies. Most of the colonies are going to develop a very similar political structure. Uh, they're going to have a governor who's going to be the most powerful political figure, and the governor is going to be who speaks with either parliament or the king in England. Below the governor is going to be a legislature, and normally it has two houses, just like the Virginia legislature does. There's going to be a House of Commons and a House of Lords, or in the case of Virginia, House of Commons and House of Burgesses. Both those houses were elected by landowners, and very often the House of Burgesses is going to be a lifelong appointment. The county level is still the main level of work, just like it was in Virginia. Um, the legislature can pass laws, they can enact taxes, they can advise the legislature. The county court, they are the ones who establish how to collect the taxes. They do the day-to-day -day punishments, the day-to-day -day work. Now, what does all that mean? Well, as early as the early 1700s, the colonies are operating on a degree and a belief of self-government. That means that this idea of political independence, it's not unique to the American Revolution. It's a process that began in the early 1700s. Now, little by little, one by one, the crown begins to reassert control of the colonies. Individual rights are canceled, and the, the royal monarchs create these royal comp, uh, charters, these royal colonies, where the colony answers only to the king instead of to the people. All right, for this week, I know this is a long one, I'm sorry, but for this week, you do have your first reflection paper due, and I just wanted to quickly remind you that you can use any of the readings that we did from lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, lesson four, uh, so maybe you, you really like the Salem Witch Trial readings, maybe you really were interested in the laws of Virginia, or maybe you just couldn't believe what the Spanish were doing in the Caribbean. Whatever choice you make, uh, you need to give me your thoughts, your opinions, your ideas on that. So one paragraph about the, the American dogs, and then about a page, page and a half, double space it about how you felt reading the argument, what it made you think about, whether you liked it or didn't like it, et cetera, et cetera. The whole goal behind this is to get you thinking creatively, uh, get you able to present a coherent and cohesive opinion, and be able to write it down on paper in a way that makes sense. All of these are skills that will be extremely useful whether you go into the workforce when you're done with this class or if you're going to go into a four-year college. 
So just keep that in the back of your mind when you're doing your reflection papers, and I look forward to reading them. They're usually interesting. All right, until next time, we'll see you later. Any questions, concerns, comments, please email me, and I'll get back in touch.